for me. Here we are, so we can start. Um, hello, everyone who has joined us on Facebook, and uh, I believe that there would be a few people who will join us in Zoom. And first of all, I want to thank the Embassy of the United States in Ukraine for supporting this important project, Bordering, Rebordering, Debordering, and uh, to thank the military forces of Ukraine, armed forces, um, for it having this opportunity to uh, conduct the lectures, to have these streams, um, despite all the conditions. Okay, and today we continue speaking about borders. And uh, um, I, first of all, I want to thank our today's speaker, Isis Luxemburger, for joining the project, for participation in it. And Isis is a doctoral researcher, the chair of North American Literary and Cultural Status at Saarland University. And today we talk about the representation of borders in industrial films on the Saarland's heavy industry. So thank you, Isis. The floor is yours. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. So I will just start sharing my screen for you. Here we go. Repeat. So, perfect. So let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody on Zoom and on Facebook. I'm really happy to be here, first of all. So thank you for inviting me. And I'm also very happy, even happier, that you are all here to learn today and discuss about the representation of borders in industrial films on the Saarland's heavy industry. So what I would like to do today is to provide you with an overview of different types of borders present in films on the Saarland's heavy industry. And I'm going to give you many, many examples. And I will also try to show you that although I quote, geographical borders are usually the first ones to spring to mind, end of quote. Those are by far not the only borders, neither in general nor in the industrial films on the Saarland. And I would like to get started with this interesting example of a map, which tends to get uh, geographers close to heart attacks. So I'm sorry for all geographers, geographers who are present today. Um, so it shows a Saar basin, which is about four times the size of Belgium, which is far bigger than Holland and quite close to the English Channel, not to mention the uh, close to invisible microscopic Luxembourg. And it yields the impression that we could very quickly travel to Berlin or to London from Saarbrücken. So I wish it was true, which is it, <laughs> which it is not. And the reason I, I chose this map was that it clearly focuses on the Saar, as I will do in my talk today. And we will come back to this map shortly after a general look at geographical borders in industrial films. As they visualize geographical borders, maps are the most common means employed to represent geographical borders in industrial films. And thereby they serve three main purposes to present the geographical setting of the film, to help the viewer locate and spatially relay different locations presented in the film, or to illustrate processes or changes over time. So let's take a look at some examples and profit from this visual power of maps. The initial geographical localization of the treated subject, so the SAR in our case, is very common, especially in films made for a public outside of the Saar of Germany or even of Europe. The public addressed by this film, for example, is Danish. And the film shows a map of Europe, including Denmark, which is then followed by a close up of the Saar between France, Western Germany, and Luxembourg. As this film was made in 1962, you can imagine how hard it must have been to spot the little black Saarland on the left map on a small tube TV, which already leads us back to the initial map, lacking realism and accuracy to scale. It's especially in comparison with an even more detailed initial map from an even older film that the pragmatism of the right inaccurate map becomes clear. So just try to spot the Saarland on the left map 
on an old ship TV when you don't know where to look for it. Although the map of uh, Europe in Saarland Glückauf is supplemented by this detailed map of the Saarland, it might still be unclear for some viewers where to locate this tiny country within Europe. The map on the right side, taken from the American travelogue, the Saar from 1935, geographically relates the place of interest, the Saar Basin, to what US American viewers probably know and recognize on the map, England, the Channel, France and Germany, and thereby it succeeds in presenting the geographical setting in one single map. The second purpose maps serve in industrial films is the spatial relation between different locations presented in the film as the industry's networks almost always extend the geographical borders of the Saar and stretch out into the greater region, which means into Luxembourg, France and Belgium. In Der Stahlbaron, The Steel Baron, a Franco-German co-production from 2018, an animated 3D map is shown initially to locate the Ferdinand Ironworks on it and then reappears throughout the film in order to spatially relate other places of interest to it. The map is not only shown from above, in some shots, the camera departs from the 3D structures on the map, so to speak, on the ground, and then zooms out to reveal the bigger picture of spatial relations, thereby linking the geographical map closer to the space it represents. And now I'd like to show you this dynamic animation of this map before we move on. Auch andere Unternehmer wie Thyssen, Krupp, Stinnes und Stumm haben im deutsch-französischen Grenzgebiet ihre Interessen. 12% der Region befinden sich in ihrer Hand. Das Erzbecken von Longvibri ist gewaltig. Es so the third purpose we'll take a closer look at consists in the illustration of processes and changes over time. In this first example, the growth of the European coal and steel community is shown by coloring more and more joining countries in white, following the chronological order of their entry. And again, as this process is better illustrated by the film than by two screenshots, I would also like to show this one to you. Parallelement, la liste des pays représentés à Luxembourg s'allongeait. Le Danemark, la Suède, la Suisse, la Norvège, l'Autriche et le Japon envoyaient à leur tour des délégations. La communauté n'est pas renfermée sur elle-même, elle vit à l'heure du monde. In the second example, the border shifts of the geographical but also the economical borders of the Saar are illustrated by a chronological succession of maps. In this case, the maps are physical printed boards on a wall which the camera captures. This partly overlap of geographical and economical borders already hints at the difficulty of clearly separating and disentangling borders, which are often interwoven. Another type of border which is closely linked to the geographical ones are national borders. These are represented in various ways in industrial films on the Saar, for example, by barriers, officers or road signs, for example, when they accompany the act of crossing the border. The depiction of this border crossing is taken to extremes in the Franco-German co-production Usine sans frontières, Grenze ohne Schatten, Factories without borders, borders without shadows from 1968, in which a German and a French colleague cross the border, which means a detail that they have to stop the car for a passport control by a French officer followed by a customs control by a French customs officer before they can cross the lifted barrier and then they have to stop again for another passport control by a German officer and another customs control by a German customs officer before the process of border crossing is finally completed. In this case, an overlap of national and economical borders is illustrated by the teams of border and customs officer. However, these borders are not always as visible as they are here. The road on the still on the right is taken from the same film and it is the border between Germany and France. So in this place, crossing the border is not as complicated as we just saw. And the pedestrian crossing you see here actually coincides with the border crossing. This contrast is also emphasized by the film's voiceover narrator. I quote, here Germany, there France. This is a region in which not more than crossing a road is necessary to go from one country to the other, end of quote. 
And besides different degrees of difficulty of crossing the border for people, differences can also be made in differentiating between people and goods and between different goods. The permeability of the border is thus multivalent. This aspect of the border between Germany and France is especially emphasized in films made after the creation of the European coal and steel community in 1952. And the open borders are often symbolized by trains loaded with iron ore, coal or steel products. But even before the creation of the ECSC, the image of trains was used to promote a future Europe based on the mineral wealth and the industry of today's greater region. In Saarland Glück auf, an image film made in 1950 to promote the Saarland's independence and exceptional position between Germany and France, the narrator emphasizes, I quote, for about 80 years have trains loaded with coal from over here and all from over there and constantly crossing each other been symbolizing this exchange, end of quote. In Histoire de Entrete, which retraces the history and development of the ESCS two years after its creation, the first train's unhindered crossing of the border symbolize the treaty's victory. I quote, on February 10th, 1953, a first train loaded with European coal, followed three months later by a first train, steel train, crossed the abolished borders unhindered, end of quote. In 1959, after the reunification of the Saarland and the Federal Republic of Germany, the annulation of borders is again illustrated by trains. I quote, the borders are annulled for ore and coal by the ECSC agreement. The Lorenese Minet ore reaches the Sawa steelworks without hindrance, end of quote. And even in later films, such as Dizar, a film on the River Saar from 1965, this crisscrossing of trains at the open border is still emphasized as an extraordinary characteristic of the Saarland. I quote, at the border stations to France, rail traffic runs continuously to and fro. German and French locomotives fetch and bring trains with coal or steel. One has the good feeling that there is no border here, end of quote. Speaking of open and abolished borders in industrial films on the Saar, one border type keeps being presented as an alternative to the concept of man-made national geographical borders. The geological borders of the underground mineral resources, which link all parts of today's greater region through the heavy industry. The Montandreieck or Triangle Lour, so the coal and steel triangle, is like in this example, presented as the neutral, the, as the natural foundation stone of the European coal and steel community and later of today's European Union. Such as this recent example of a two-part Arte documentary entitled Die Steinkohle Le Charbon from 2018, in which the geology is represented by black coal underneath the geographical map of Europe and this black matter, so to speak, or black substance of the geological formation is also used in further animations, whereby their uniform look forms a continuity throughout both 90 minute parts of the documentary. It also illustrates the common ground on which Europe exists and emphasizes the natural order of its unity. In the second part of the documentary, a historian says, I quote, it is quite symbolic that coal from Germany, Belgium, and France is being pooled, especially coal that belongs to the same deposit anyway, a deposit that has been that had been chopped up by borders, end of quote. And while he speaks, the black matter and the geological map reappear, emphasizing the natural unity which national borders violate, and to which he refers going on, I quote, in principle, it is a return to the natural order of things because in this coal field between France, Belgium, and Germany, really, there are no borders underground, end of quote. Don't take that for granted, though. I could give you another whole lecture proving the contrary, that there are indeed borders underground, but we don't have time for this today. As we have just seen the natural order, natural reality of the coal basin is explicitly referred to in this interview and opposed to man-made borders disturbing this order. From here, let us move on to another type of borders which already 
shines through this example of the Franco-German co-production, a German and a French version of which was aired in the respective countries. Linguistic borders play an important role in various contexts in industrial films. One of them is the necessity of interpreters when people of different national and linguistic backgrounds meet to assure smooth communication. Mostly interpreters appear in official events, like in these two examples. In the top right corner, Hermann Röchling, the former boss of the Völklingen Ironworks, can be seen in the dock at the Rastatt trials, the French war crime tribunals after the Second World War, listening to the interpretation as the judges and the attorneys spoke French. In the bottom right corner, you can see one of the interpreters who was present at the trials and later interviewed for another documentary. The four stills on the left show the more complex interpretation of the creation of the European coal and steel community. Apart from professional interpreters, non-professional speaking two or more languages did of course also interact, also act as interpreters in everyday situations and also bilingualism plays an important role. We will, however, not take a closer look at these aspects now. The other example of linguistic borders I would like to show you instead refers to foreign language use. In the postmodern documentary Hermann Röchling oder der Krieg als industrielle Herausforderung, Hermann Röchling or War as an Industrial Challenge from 1990, the former steel worker Ludwig Honecker addresses the communication with forced workers during the Second World War at the Völklingen Ironworks. I quote, I learned Russian for the simple reason to better communicate with the Russians for work, but some might have seen it politically until one day a man said to me, you're playing with your throat. Yes, you talk to the foreigners, to the Russians and to the French. End of quote. The reason for which he learned foreign language was communication at his workplace. And before we delve into the second half of the quote, let's have a look at Honecker's justification of foreign language use, which he adds directly after this quote. I quote, I said, when I get a Russian to help me and he needs a hammer, I don't wave my fist in the air for half an hour and then he still doesn't know what I want from him. But I say to him, Prenesti Molotov, Makasila Tam. And then he goes to get a hammer. But I still tell him the word in German, hammer. And when I get a Frenchman and he also needs a hammer, I say to him, Monsieur, cherche un marteau, ma cassis la bas. You don't know how to do all that. And while you're still waving your fist in the air, my Russian and my Frenchman have already made 50 feathers. That's for the benefit of the company, end of quote. As I said, we'll now get back to the second half of the quote on the last side, slide, which tells us that speaking Russian is interpreted beyond practical foreign language use as a political statement and orientation by his colleagues, which leads us to political borders. In Honecker's case, there was a truth in this assumption as he actually was a communist and the film addresses the bigger problem linked to this political affiliation. I quote, Ludwig Honecker has been a communist. He managed to stay employed at Röchlings, although the company regulations forbade it, end of quote. This ban of communists, as well as others, is then further explained by quoting Röchlings corresponding company regulations. I quote, Führer and followers form an operational community for the benefit of the people and the state. Since the Führer and the followers form the company community based on the bond of a common national socialist conviction, only those sharing this conviction can be members of the company community." End of quote. In both quotes, the borders are visible also in the wording, the vocabulary of exclusion which is used. Besides communists, trade unionists and social democrats were also unwanted under Röchling's reign. So he had spies keep lists of the participants at reunions of the Social Democratic Party and trade unions, lists that were used by the company to fire workers or not to hire them in the first place. This topic is addressed in the modern documentary Der Stahlbaron, the Baron of Steel, and illustrated by reenacted scenes of 
uh, of workers sharing forbidden leaflets or newspapers. Reuchling didn't stop there, however. His influence also extended into other spheres of his workforces and their families' lives. Religious borders are yet another type which becomes visible in films on the ironworks. At the predominantly Catholic Saar, the Protestant employer reserved leading positions within the company for Protestant workers. The symbol for his influence in the sphere of religion is a religious building, the Versöhnungskirche, so the Reconciliation Church in Völklingen. In its construction, Röchling acted as a donor, but also as a financier. The four iron statues adorning the church's facade were made of his iron, and the fresco painting under the church's ceiling shows not only saints, but also the ironworks on the bottom of, bottom of the on the bottom right still, and some of its owners and architects. As one of Röchling's statues in the top right corner of the slide shows a soldier about to throw a hand grenade, religious borders are not only created but also pushed here. As I know that the fresco is not very well visible on this slide, I would like to show you a little clip from the Eiserne Schatz, the Iron Treasure, on this piece of religious art. So here comes the peculiar fres fresco, and uh, I muted this video so there won't be sound in order not to distract you with a German sound from enjoying this uh, religious art painting. It is mainly in recent films that borders of gender get addressed. Older industrial films often create the illusion of an entirely male space. A photograph from around 1900 has become the iconic image of women working in the SARS iron and steel industry, the quote unquote Erzengel, which is a homonym in German meaning both or angel and archangel. These women, whom you can see on the left stills, carry tons and tons of iron ore on their heads from barges on the river to wagons ashore, which then transported the ore into the Ferkling and Ironworks. This photograph is the only visual evidence of their existence. As the right stills hint at, recent films also make an effort to make visible female workers and forced workers during the world wars, but also beyond. At the same time, they illustrate the persistence of the imaginary of a male space created and upheld by the male workforce. And before we get back to this male space, I would like to show you something from the greater region, more precisely from Bologna, Belgium. This silent film on women and men charging coal vessels in Liège on the river Meuse was made by the Museum of Life in Wallonia, the Musée de la Vie Vallonne, in the 1930s. It does not uh, show the ore angels decharging vessels at the Saar. However, it does show women charging vessels, and this is a really wonderful advantage we have in the greater region with similar industries everywhere. So we don't have time to watch the entire film, unfortunately, but I will just show you a, a few stills from it as it shows not just the work, but also the women themselves towards its end. And these portraits of the chargeuses show us quite some interesting things. For example, that both young and old women did this work and that not just unmarried women charged the boats which the ring in the bottom left still shows us. Additionally, the detailed depiction of the, of the charging of the vessels also gives us a better idea of how the ore was unloaded from the vessels at the Völkring and Ironworks before the ore angels put the fully loaded, loaded baskets on their heads. As promised, we will now get back to the persisting image uh, imaginary of the male space of the Ironworks. 
Der eiserne Schatz, the iron treasure, retails the one and only time that a former worker's wife, whom you can see on the left still, dared to ask for her husband at the ironworks gate when he didn't come home one day. The reason for which he hadn't come home was a severe accident he had had at the high furnace. But even years later, he still defends banning his wife from the ironworks premises as she would have made a fool of him in front of his comrades belonging to the male space inside as the worried woman penetrating this space from the outside. The second example for spatial borders shows that Italian workers were banned from bars and restaurants at the start, not from, from all, but from some. However, this is also interesting when thinking back to the linguistic borders we just discussed earlier, because the signs are bilingual to make sure that the Italians get aware of that spatial border they shall not cross. And the Italian version is much more explicit and strict. So this tells us that a real effort was made to cross a linguistic border in order to set up a spatial border here. The type of border you might not have thought of before if you are unf unfamiliar with border studies is the epistemological border. In the industry, it is however quite important as knowledge can be a crucial competitive advantage. For this reason, epistemological borders are often intentionally created and upheld. A film suggesting the opposite to tear down epistemological borders is the image film Usine Sans Frontières, Grenze ohne Schatten, in which cross-border cooperation is promoted and joint forces are presented as the best way to face competition from outside the region. This hand-drawn map also reminds us of the entanglement of the different types of borders we are looking at today, and so does the next example. As the lack of knowledge can be a severe competitive disadvantage, overcoming epistemological borders by knowledge transfers is crucial. It was for his expertise as an engineer that Eugen Pracht joined the Völkingen Ironworks, leaving his former workplace in Upper Silesia. His move interweaves knowledge transfers and work migration, as well as other types of borders linked to them. And I have one last thrilling example of epistemological borders and knowledge transfers in industrial films for you, which is industrial espionage, or as they put it, attentive note-taking and copying for competitive advantages, a practice which brought many innovations to Völklingen which were inspired by the US American iron and steel works and hence linked to more borders. An example which I find quite impressive is the following on borders of remembrance. It is an account of an interviewee not directly affiliated to the ironworks, but who shares a childhood memory of forgotten workers he saw when getting lost on the ironworks premises during a visit with his school class. This memory of the workers becomes visible through the film and thereby crosses quite some borders. I quote, we ended up in front of the salt building. It was a two-story house. In front of its gable stood three workers. And there, next to it, the aggregates for the blast furnace were stored. That was salt. And the three of them stood there like ghosts, totally eaten up by the salt their heads and everything, their skin, their faces, they looked like lepers. Today, nobody knows about this salt building anymore and the victims anymore. Even at the Völkling and Ironworks, it is no longer shown. That was a terrible thing. These men were condemned to death as they stood there." End of quote. And I thought that after this rather melancholic account, we should look at a nice and fun visual example. It is a montage employed in the Danish documentary Berufe in Europa, Professions in Europe, to overcome the border between the home and the workplace of an iron worker to closely link these two spheres. Match cuts are used for this purpose when switching locations between the ironworks and the home. And to explain what a match cut is, I suggest that we take a closer look at the stills. The principle is the same for all three match cuts. 
a scene shot at the ironworks is shown before a switch of scene of action and the last object shown at the ironworks before the shift and the first object shown at home after the shift resemble each other. They match, so we have a match cut. So from left to right at the ironworks, a sample of liquid iron is taken in front of the high furnace with the two looking like a giant soup ladle. And at home, sauerkraut is served with a big spoon. From sparks emitted at the ironworks, it is cut to sparks emitted at home where the balcony balustrade is being welded. And a worker looks at a surveillance screen at the ironworks before a TV is shown on which the workers' kids watch a children's program. And now I invite you to watch these three match cuts with me. Hier sehen Sie den übrigen ja, Teil der Familie. Familie. Wie fahrst du jetzt mit 45 Automatik oder von Hand? Für die jüngsten der Familie Die Zeit reicht gerade noch für einen schnellen Blick auf den Fernseher des Abends. Die Kinderstunde hat ganz gute Ratschläge für Filmamateure. So, from a film historic perspective, this film's montage is especially interesting, as it is quote unquote only a Danish documentary far from a Hollywood blockbuster. And as we are still six years ahead of Stanley Kubrick's iconic match cut from 2001, A Space Odyssey, which came out in 1968, in which a bone turns into a spaceship, thereby creating a temporal arc between past and future. So sorry for this little digression, but uh, I really find this fascinating from a film history point of view. So please bear with me. And I could actually go on with more and more and more borders and with more and more examples. Um, and if you spot one in on this list here, which particularly interests you, I suggest that you just take a little note on it so we can come back to it in the discussion. But before we get to the discussion, I would like to invite you to watch a short film on the Saar from 1935, from which the initial map was taken. So the Saar. And this physical film has crossed many borders in the past four years. Although I have absolutely no idea who is watching this right now. And then afterwards, of course, I assume that at least some of you in the audience do not know what I'm talking about when I'm referring to a physical film. So I will show you. This is the steel box of a 16 millimeter copy of the Saar made in the United States in 1935. And it has been stored in the collection of a colleague in Montreal, Louis Peltier, for nearly 20 years now. He bought it at a flea market together with other travelogues. And as the Saar was no region he looked into and was working on, he just kept the film in his cupboard. And when I met him in 2019 and we exchanged on our project, he remembered this film, which is an incredible treasure, not just to me personally, but for the silent really. Why is that so? Because it depicts the everyday life in 1935. And this is extremely rare in the interwar period. And precisely because it is so rare, I would like to invite you to watch this 10 minute film with me and also to rewatch it as we are only able to watch it after uh, the film was digitized by the Canadian film platform zoom out which is an incredible treasure not just sorry where am i so zoom out um where it is now available and i will share um the link afterwards in the chat so you can re-watch it um also when you um are watching this later so the recording and uh 
yeah, I hope that the quality will be fine for you. It all depends on your internet collection, uh, connection. It will be in the recording. So just in any case, you will be able to see it as many times as you want online. So here it is. This is the SAR. What is it? Where is it? What does it do? Well, let's see if we can figure it out. It's a small district of immense mineral wealth. At the end of the World War, this line was agreed upon as the international boundary between France on the west and Germany on the east. During the war, the French coal mines in this northern district were destroyed by the German army. As compensation, it was agreed that for 15 years, France should enjoy the entire output of the rich coal mines located in the Saar Basin on German territory. But the Saar district was to remain neutral, neither French nor German. The 15 years were up on the 13th of January, 1935, and on that date, a big majority of the inhabitants voted to join the German Reich. The most important town in the Saar district is Saarbrücken. We are walking along the main street of the town, and as we look up, we see the German flag proclaiming the nationality of the place. It was in that building that the votes were counted. This traffic cop is on the job, and though he appears to be nonchalant, just try to pass a red light. Parkin verboten, no parking. Those two words are law in every country, and they certainly enforce it over there. Here's another League of Nations. Comic papers from Paris, scandal sheets from Hollywood, and German dolls with French price tags. The majority of the people here belong to the Roman Catholic faith. This is one of their fine old churches. These are the lists of over one half a million voters. The lists were posted publicly for several months before the election, so as to give ample time for detecting errors and making protests. Here is where the Saarbrücken housewives come to do their marketing. The Saar peasants certainly know how to make things grow. Just look at those fine potatoes. And oh boy, what delicious soup they can make with those cabbages. This is a typical Tsar schoolhouse. The youngsters were hard at work studying, but with the ringing of the bell, out they come ready for play. Our oh, boys and girls are like the world over. They are just as enthusiastic in play as they are in their studies. But at a sharp command from the singing master, they line up. Saar, which flows through the district, is used to distribute a part of the coal from the mines. It is estimated that the mines still contain more than 16 billion tons of coal. No wonder that the contest for their possession was so keen. This picturesque bridge was built by the Romans centuries ago. It accounts for the name of the town, Saarbrück, which means Saar Bridge. And say, the Saar women certainly know how to use their heads. The 70,000 men who work in the mines live in endless rows of houses like these. The mines with their shaft houses and dependencies are close by. Here is a crew of miners reporting for their shift. Each miner carries a Davy safety lamp 
which provides the only light by which they have to work in the dark underground tunnels. Why, even old Dobbin has a lamp, so they can locate him in the dark. It is the spirit and industry of men like these that made it possible for the Tsar to ship 175 million tons of coal into France during the past 16 years, to say nothing of what was sent to other countries. The miners now enter the cages and are swiftly carried down, down 3,000 feet or more below the surface to the different levels where they are to work. There are 820,000 inhabitants in the Tsar, but they are not all miners and iron workers. To begin with, there are thousands of peasants who raise all the produce that is consumed in the district. Then there are big glass works, manufacturers of leather, wool spinning mills, and chemical works that add their quota to the prosperity of the region. This is one of the biggest piles of black diamonds in the world. It gives us some idea of the immense mineral wealth concentrated in this small district. The same cages that took the miners down to their work now return to the top carrying the loaded mine cars. The coal cars run off the cages by gravity and then run downgrade to the different points where they are needed. For the coal used locally, they still depend on the primitive ox cart for delivery. A mine car mounted on pivots fills the cart at one fell swoop. And off go the white oxen with their black load. It's a wonder how those oxen manage to stay so white. The coal for household use is delivered in small hand carts drawn by women and children. And now that the day's work is done, the miners come up out of the earth for a breathing spell, glad to be in daylight once more, where they can fill their lungs with fresh air, to say nothing of having a little smoke. Oh, it's tough all right to spend hours at a time in a deep black hole digging out black coal and getting one's face all blacked up so that some of them look like Al Jolson. We take this train to visit some of the iron and steel mills of the district. Here is one of them in all its glory of smoke and soot, towering blast furnaces and tall belching chimneys. An iron and steel mill is quite an extensive and complicated institution. These Saarlanders are quite up to date. Their mills are most complete and are provided with the latest modern devices for handling enormous weights quickly and safely. It's a ticklish job to move heavy ladles around, especially when these ladles contain tons of white hot liquid iron. The slightest mistake in switching might cause a grave disaster, but the Germans are careful and methodical. And now we come to the most impressive exhibition in a steel mill the tapping of a blast furnace in which the iron has been melted until it runs like water. The light given off is blinding and we have to wear smoke glasses. The heat is intense and we have to keep our distance. Our cameraman was up against it. They covered his camera with a full suit of asbestos to keep it from catching fire. Then they rigged him out in a fireproof helmet and asbestos apron to keep his flesh from being seared by the inferno. And now the fiery stream is directed into a pouring ladle. From the ladle, it passes into a mold where it will remain until it has cooled enough for handling. Here is a full ladle of white hot molten iron being moved out into the yard.
Buckets with overhead wheels move along aerial cables, dropping their loads at desired points. Powerful electromagnets swinging from overhead cranes pick up the heavy ingots of iron as if they were just so many straws. When the current is cut off, they drop the iron at the proper place, ready for loading and shipping. As we leave this seething center of human industry and mineral wealth, impressed with the tenacity and endurance of these hard-working Sarlanders, we offer them our sincere good wishes for their future well-being and prosperity. So my 45 minutes are over and I do hope that I did broaden your perspective on borders today and I'm looking forward to jumping back to some of, of them now in the discussion. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Isis. Thank you for a great presentation and lecture. It was really interesting, um, especially the classification. I was not aware of that. So many aspects are covered by the border studies. Okay, and as far as I know, we have a question from Professor Natalia Vosotska. Uh, so, Natalia, could you please turn on video and the sound? Just a second. Oh, and I will just post the link into the chat so I don't forget about it. Uh -huh. And I will copy it and uh, post it under the video, I guess. Uh, so, Natalia, um, hey, while we are waiting for Natalia, we shall check the uh, uh, Facebook whether we have any questions from the viewers or not. Uh -huh. As far as I see, there are no questions uh, there. So, uh, Natalia is with us, almost, almost there. Almost there, yeah. I'm sorry, there was something wrong with, with the technology. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Luxembourg for her enlightening uh, speech to us for her lecture, because she provided in a very interesting perspective on uh, the subject we are being, we've been discussing. And I wanted to ask you about the political agenda behind uh, many of such films, and in particular, the one we had just an opportunity to see. What was the, um, the, the reason for making that film in the United States in 1935? Was it like promotion? Was it like uh, um, just calling upon uh, Americans to cooperate, what do you think about it? And the music, because the music is very light and it does not come in line with the quite serious contents of the film. Yeah, so personally, I was really surprised to actually find this film because I would never have expected that there would be an American production of uh, this time. It is actually part of a larger, a very large series of travelogues. Um, so this is um, stated as the fourth, but uh, there were more films. And it is, at the beginning, I was really struck by the fact that the Tsar was in there because the other films are on the New York waterfront, Madeira, <laughs> all the nice sunny islands you can travel to. So it, it was really a kind of travelogue, so nice destinations to, to show. So these films were actually displayed in, in cinemas before the other films. Um, and so I thought, well, why would they travel to the Saarland? But um, in general, also with the New York, New York Waterfront film, for instance, one can see that the um, the directors or the producers were really interested in technology and at, in industry. And um, I think the reason why the Saar made it in there was this really special position. So it it, it was not a country it was not not a country it was between two countries mm -hmm. so um this period between the two world wars um or 
not the two world wars exactly, but uh, between 1920 and 1935, that the Tsar was independent. And the fact that this was unique in the world um, mm -hmm. made the, the Americans actually interested in this. Um, so for the political aspect, I would say it is neutral. So it, it just states, okay, they just voted for Germany. So actually the film crew was there two weeks after um, the plebiscite. So, um, and this is another really interesting point about the film because there is so much footage on the Saar um, in 1934 and on the election day, so until January 15th, 1935. And all of these films show that uh, there are um, displays of the German flag um, everywhere in the street. So everything is decorated and uh, it's really, really nationalist and pro-national socialist. Whereas in this film, you have this one flag and there it's just everyday life. You don't have this image of the Saarland, which absolutely wants the Saarland as the, the lost child to return into the arms of, of Hitler Germany. Um, so this is really, really special that they do not get deep into this political aspect. So they show um, the uh, all the lists for, for the vote that took place to uh, yeah, have a little background, but they do not get into this uh, deeply at all. So this is extremely interesting as it is really focused on the people and not the politics. So this is really, really special. Um, other films like uh, Saarland Gluck also, this is from 1950, for example, was made as a promotional film to make people at the second plebiscite vote for the independence of the Saarland and not for Germany or France, which didn't happen. So to return to Germany again. Um, but this again was really highlighting this special position as a medium and intermediate between France and Germany and uh, wanted to convince people to vote for an independent Saarland, which didn't happen. But it's a beautiful film, so it's really artsy. Do you think it might have something to do with the Roosevelt's New Deal? and uh, democratization of American life at that time with its focus on uh, really ordinary, ordinary people, especially working people. Well, maybe the, the series started, I think in 1932 or 1933 and then continued for, for quite some, some time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Actually, it, it uh, well, the reason for which this film was, was really lost was that the production company was specialized in animation films mm -hmm. and not in travelogues. So they did a lot of these, but their, their main focus was animated films. And then with the rise of Walt Disney, they got bankrupt really quickly. <laughs> Yes, thank you very so, much. Um, this is why it is really difficult to find out anything about these films because there is no archive of um, of RKO pictures. It's it's dispersed. So I, I would really love to have some background on on this whole series and why it was made and what they thought about it. But uh, it's really difficult to find anything at all. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Isis. And is there, um, I know that there is a difference, but what is the difference between depicting borders in contemporary films uh, comparing to the ones you've mentioned that were filmed much earlier in the mid of the 20th century, etc.? So, well, from the perspective, I would say that in, in recent films, they are actually shown as borders, so for everything that is not just uh, geographical, national, let's say obvious, but like uh, borders of gender, they are rather referred to um, as such. In the the older films, you can see them, but they are not, not addressed. Um, and I would say that in general, so in the greater region, the national border has become uh, less important 
with the European Union and the fact that you can just pass any border and of course that they mm -hmm. are not that visible anymore so you you don't have custom officers you have small signs but um, you don't have to actively go through a border crossing um, process so sometimes you just uh, get the message on your phone and you're like oh I'm in France um, and in the films it has to rather become this this invisible border and also this idea of having the greater region um, instead of this uh, well the the nations forming it mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much for answering the question for the presentation and for being with us these days and first of all i want to thank germany for uh, the help it gives to ukraine it's really important for us today all right so i shall stop the stream here i think and thank you very much thanks everyone who has joined us just a second uh-huh